Good morning. Welcome into God's house. Welcome into Long Meadow Church of the Brethren. Welcome one and all for the sermon titled Combine. And you can probably imagine where my mind's at this morning. Our scripture lesson today comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And there was a story told to church, at church this morning about potatoes, and it reminded me of a story. On a particular street, on one side of the street, lived a God-fearing, God-loving woman. And every morning she would come out and say a prayer how much she thanked God for having everything in her life. Opposite her house, the other side of the street, was an atheist who came out every day when she came out and fussed at her. And this goes on for some period of time till one day the woman came out and she was very distraught. She had lost her job and she was very worried and she was, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I know you'll provide. I know you'll give me everything I need. But I don't know where the meals and the groceries are coming from, Lord. I just give it to you. And she walked in the house. Now the atheist had heard this and thought, I'm going to play a joke on her. So he rushed off down to the grocery store and loaded up two shopping bags, two shopping carts, full of bags of food and snuck out there the next morning and put everything on her porch. When she walked out that morning, he wanted to see it all, so he hid in the bush. And she came out and looked down and saw the groceries. And she was so taken, she said, Lord, thank you for providing. I never lost faith in you. I never lost faith in you. Thank you, amen. And about that time, the atheist jumped out and goes, ha, 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 see that? I'm the one that put these groceries here. What do you think about that? And the woman closed her eyes again. And she said, and thank you, Lord, for making the devil bring them to me. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble. And gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all and in all. May God add His blessings to these passages as we seek Him out in prayer. Would you please join with me? Father, give these words strength and lift us up through them. We need to hear Your message. We need to have something to cling to daily. And so Father, these words, use them to strengthen us and carry us along. We thank You, Father, that You have given this message. And it reminds us of your son Jesus and his love and the burden he took away from us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to know this name because I think it is ranking up there. Now you all know I have a list of really cool names that I have read about over history. And this name has now made it into the top ten. You ready? Oceanus Hopkins. Oceanus Hopkins. Now he's famous. He's famous for one thing and one thing only, and he didn't even do it on purpose. Does anybody in this room, other than me, know who Oceanus Hopkins is? No? Not even Mr. History? All right. <clears throat> on September 16th, they caught up to what would be a prosperous wind. After waiting and waiting and waiting, on September 16th, Bradford, the leader of this group, looked out and said it was a prosperous wind and left safety on a shore thousands of miles away to begin a journey to a new place. And what? All right, fine. To the agricultural friends of mine, who watched this, who was waiting for a sermon about combines, let me get you set off to the side. His name 
was Preacher Bell. And Robert Bell was born in Scotland. And Robert Bell in 1826 gave us the first combine. And throughout the years, he took the reaping machine that he had invented and put it out to use and never patented it because he believed that no man, nobody should profit from the gifts that God gives them. He never sought it. But in 1831, Obed Hussey, and if you don't know this and you live in this state, I encourage you to get into your car, your truck, your bicycle or whatever and drive over to Union Bridge, Maryland and read the big cast iron sign. It's on there. Obed Hussey took a patent built by Robert Bell, built the reaping machine to which Cyrus McCormick went and saw it, fell in love with it, built it, became famous, International Harvester grew out of it. In 1911, Holt, which would later become Caterpillar, built the first self-powered reaping multifunction machine, the Combine. 1923, the Baldwin Brothers and their Combine known as Gleaner. The Baldwin Brothers were Mennonites. Designed the first complete Combine. And in 1937, Australian-born Thomas Carroll, working for Massey Harris up in Canada, put everything together, put a way to move it on its own, and the world saw the first self-propelled, self-contained, all-in-one, multi-unit, multi-level functioning harvesting apparatus, as the patent said, otherwise known as the Combine Harvester. There, now you're happy. Can I get back to my story? Thank you very much. There is madness in my method. No, method in my madness. The living quarters for 102 passengers were cramped. They lived in an area about 80 feet by 20 feet, which is 1,600 square feet, with a ceiling that was just shy of 5 feet tall. Couples lived and packed in closely together, yet they wanted all one heart, all one mind. They wanted a chance to try this new thing called breaking away from the church. And so they set out on a journey that should never have been undertaken in a boat called the Mayflower. Now, for those of you who don't understand, and I know I'm out in front of things a little bit, but there is a reason I'm talking about it today. Today. They got on board a boat that was never meant to go more than 150 miles in birth to birth. The ship was not built for it. It was in bad shape. It leaked. It acted up. It twisted. It groaned. The ship came so close midway across the Atlantic Ocean to being unable to sail. A storm had so badly damaged its main beam that they actually thought about turning around in the middle of the ocean and going back. But by a stroke of luck, one of the colonists had a metal jack screw that he had purchased in Holland to help in the construction of new homes. A great big metal bolt. They used it to secure the beam, which kept it from cracking further and thus brought, bore, brought forth back the seaworthiness of the vehicle by combining everything together as one. They began to make their journey. Despite the crowding and unsanitary conditions, the constant prayer left only one fatality and one birth. During the journey of 65 days, Oceanus Hopkins was born on the Mayflower. On November 19th, they caught sight of land for the very first time after 65 days on the ocean, in a boat that was never meant to be there. In conditions that are smaller by half than this room we currently sit in. In ceilings they were cramped in that were less than five feet tall. I am 6'1". Imagine that. Don't do bump. A lot of knots on heads, I'll bet you. But then they heard that famous word, Land ho! And that actually took place just a short few days from today. 
They saw the first land. Then they got into sight on November 19th and they dropped the anchor on November 21st. But before setting that anchor, the pilgrims and the non-pilgrims, the people on the ship, the workers, the captain, the pilgrims, all came together in prayer. A congregation referred to as strangers drew up these words. In the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together. Known as the Mayflower Pact. It was to establish an order. It was to stop the increasing strife within the ranks. Miles Standish was selected to make sure the rules were obeyed. And before they left that boat, they became of one heart, one accord, one mind. They were combined. All the differences into one to produce fruit. It is noted that when they landed, they fell upon their knees and they were led in prayer and they blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean. They, delivered, they were delivered from the perils and miseries and had set their feet on firm and stable earth. And they sat down and they wrote the Mayflower Compact. In that short paragraph of the Mayflower Compact, they start off by saying, in the, night, in the name of God, Amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken by the glory of God an advancement of Christian faith. You hear these words. By the honor of this king and country, voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Do by these presents, solemnly and mutually in the name and presence of God and our Savior and one another, covenant and combine. To come into one body. To become one. To act as one. To base everything they do as one so that they could produce fruit so that they could be what God had set them out to be. Christian missionaries. Now I know we're way out in front of Thanksgiving and we haven't even crossed a candy holiday yet, but I don't care. Right now, as we talk, in 1620, the Mayflower was slapping its way across the Atlantic Ocean ready to land and give us all life in the new world. And use an old covenant. And use an old thought. Combination. All for one. All coming together as one. And yet in today's world, we seem to be so fractured. So today I preach on reminding ourselves that we are all the same. I'm not going to hold off on this subject much longer. I've been preaching about this for a while because it's on my heart. And all I hear right now is division and aggravation and fighting and fussing and carrying on from within churches all the way out to the outer eight reaches of what is decent and moral. Paul writes these words, as a prisoner for. It is important that you notice that word for. Not a prisoner of, not a prisoner to, as a prisoner for the Lord. What he is starting off that verse in saying is, I belong to Jesus Christ. I belong to Him and I am a messenger for Him. As a prisoner for the Lord. Meaning I have accepted the Lord. I have accepted Jesus. I have accepted His Word. I have accepted what happened. And Paul never saw it. Jesus had been crucified died, buried, rose again, and lifted to heaven long before Paul. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. That scripture says, I urge you to pay attention to being a Christian and live accordingly. Be completely humble and gentle and patient, bearing with one another in love. Combine yourselves together. 
Make every effort to keep the unity. Unity. Combine. Together. One. To the Spirit through the bond of peace. Meaning don't fight with one another in this instance. Get along with one another and remember who you are. All different, all together, all producing for the sake of Jesus Christ. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. There's one. There's only one. That's it. Paul is saying there is only one truth, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. That's it. Complete. Done. One. All the combinations fall to one point. And from the other end of that comes good and decent fruit produced. It means combining everything. You know what came out of the Mayflower Compact? They learned how to settle a new country. Now I want you to think about that for a moment because we are staring off into the not too far distance when we as Americans will celebrate a Thanksgiving Day. Now imagine if this, if you will, imagine being taken from what you know over in another country where everything you need is right there. You can go down to the baker, the butcher, candlestick maker. You knew I was going to do that, right? I'm not doing the rest of that poem. I was going to do the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. I know there's more to it. But it was right there. Back in 2009, when I traveled to Scotland for a few days, I actually saw what it meant to see the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Because in the town of Dufftown, at that time in Scotland, on the main street was a butcher here and a baker, and they still made candles. For real. Not for scented stuff. Not for flu-flu, pumpkin spice, blah, 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 whatever candle you buy. They made them to see by. Because over there, electricity goes out quite often. And having candles was necessary. And by the way, if you've never been to a baker in Scotland and watched it as they pull the stuff right out of the oven and they give you a pie made out of meat, I'm telling you right now, you will hear angels sing. Mm. But they combined. They all came together to produce. In the early days of harvesting grain, they came together to produce something great. The Christian faith here in the new world. They wanted to serve and love Christ as one without being told how to do it other than by what the Scripture says. Not the King of England. Not some minister somewhere thumping down on them. They wanted to worship Jesus Christ. They wanted to live together as one. And they wanted to put a place together to which many could come in. And so they endured 65 days of misery. Imagine if you had to do that. If you had to uproot everything, you have to come together as one. As one. In the early days of harvesting, I pulled those two together for on purpose. In the early days of harvesting, they cut down the wheat. Then they carried it in a wagon to the threshing floor where they took a stick and they beat it senseless to get the fruit out of it, to get the produce. And they worked and they struggled and they got very little. And then somebody said, why don't we do it this way with a reaping machine? And somebody said, why don't we combine it with this? Why don't we combine it with that? And now you can watch large-scale combines go through wheat fields and corn fields and take out acres of produce. All these different moving parts working together as one. When I was a kid, younger kid, younger lad, I wanted to go on the great harvest. I wanted to go on that great harvest. I wanted to get that job working in a combine, starting down in Texas somewhere, I think is where it was, and go across the middle of the United States, ending up in Upper Canada, where I would work for six months running a combine. I never did it. But I still think that maybe one day I ought to take a vacation and go try that. And my wife looks at me and goes, that machine takes all the different functions, combines them into one, and produces wheat, corn, and grain 
for which we live. The Christians that landed there took everything they had, combined into one, under the Mayflower Compact, and produced something so that they could live and grow and grow this country for Christ. And Jesus, when He took our sins on that cross, combined everything together onto Himself so that He would pay the price so that we would be forgiven now and forever and be able to produce the fruit that He wants, which is to talk about His message, His hope, His love. Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? A.W. Tozer writes in his book, The Pursuit of God, they are of one accord being tuned not to each other, but to a standard with which one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be. Were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God, they could strive for the ultimate closeness and fellowship. Last night, we went out to dinner. We went to Texas Roadhouse. Haven't been there for a while. I was so excited, I couldn't wait to get there. And we had to go in and wait. We had to sit on a bench next to the wall of meat, which I was okay with, because I just sat there looking at it, deciding which one will be my supper. And we sat there for a while, and other couples got seated because I like to sit at a table, and I don't want to sit in a booth. And while we were there, this family came in, and a young man was wearing this T-shirt with all this writing all over it. And I started to go, all right, what's that thing say? Probably something silly about this, that, or the other. And he finally turned so I could get a good look at it. And he sat down, young man, 20 years old maybe, had his hat on, was in his blue jeans, green T-shirt on. When he sat down, he turned and looked at me and I read his shirt and I was able to go, and he did this to me. We were buddies because his shirt said, Do you know my Jesus? John 3.16. Let me tell you. That's combine. That's all of us different. All of us producing, coming together in one fluid motion to produce the word of God for those who do not know. Brothers and sisters, I urge you, in this time, stay together. With everything that's going on around in this world, don't let it rip you apart. Remember the mighty snowflake. Everybody's saying, what? The mighty snowflake? You ever tried to catch one snowflake? You ever going out there and try to catch it so you can look at it real quick before it melts? Or if you're like me and you think you're real intelligent, and a couple winters ago you said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and I'm going to stick my finger in a bucket of water because it's 30 degrees below zero outside. And I'll get my finger real cool. And then when a snowflake falls on it, I'll be able to see it. You know what I got? Frostbite. But a single snowflake is the most fragile of nature's things. But just look at what they do when they stick together. When they come by. That's the beauty and glory of knowing Jesus the way we do. Be strong, brothers and sisters. Be humble, be patient, be bearing of one another. Remember, there is but one God, one truth, one Jesus, one way, and that's it. And all of us have our different uses. But together when we combine, we can actually tell people fully, beautifully, and wonderful. Let me tell you, about my Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for these words, Father. We thank you for this time that we get to spend together. And we ask you to remind us that we have all the power and strength and glory to bind ourselves together, to become as one and speak of the love, beauty, and glory that is Jesus. And in this world, in this time, in this day, when everything around us is assaulting and trying everything to rip us apart, let us be stronger together than apart. Let us pray that we stay together. Let us pray that we continue to combine together. 
Let us pray, Father, that we have you to lead us. Let us pray, Father, continually to remind us of what Jesus did when he died and paid for our sins. And we will become as one. And one day, Father, one day forever, we will be one. We thank you, Father, for this message. We thank you for this time together. We ask that you watch over and keep us and bless us in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank you. If you don't know my Jesus, if you're watching this from the other side, if you don't know it yet, then today is the day. I will never stop saying these words until I can't speak. If you don't know Him, get to know Him. If you're trying to figure it out, call me. Or if you're out there somewhere far away, find someone who knows and get with them. But know it now. Know the power and strength that comes when you combine yourself with Jesus Christ. May God bless and keep each and every one of you. Please stand and turn to page 
the name of you and the Holy Ghost, now and forever. Amen.